All right. Hi, everyone, uh, and welcome to this week's professional development talk on science communication. Uh, we have an awesome speaker coming in from the Air and Space Museum uh, in DC, Becca Lundgren. Um, I worked with her at the Air and Space Museum as a volunteer and an intern at the museum, and she taught me all the things um, that I think everyone should know. Um, but yeah, I'm going to hand it over to her. Thanks, Carly. And Carly's taught me so much about my job in science communication. So I was really honored that Carly asked me to come uh, speak with y'all today. And um, if Carly hasn't shared this, and hopefully you'll pick up on this, I'm very casual when it comes to my talks. Um, so I, I do have some slides prepared and some um, remarks prepared. But anytime you have questions, feel free to um, ask or drop in the chat, and I'll take questions at the end as well. Um, but uh, please, uh, I'd love for this to be an open conversation and dialogue. I'm really excited to be here. So I'll share my screen uh, so that we can look at the few uh, things that I have brought up. One moment. All right. So um, whenever I talk about <laughs> talking about science, um, I, I want to start, I always try to start big and get a little more narrow towards what I specifically do. Because when we talk about talking about science, there's so much encompassed in that. And all of you talk about science already in so many different ways. Um, so I, I'm going to kind of take a broad overarching view of what um, talking about science and science communication and science education means, and then talk a little bit about the specifics of my job and then come, kind of come back uh, to what you all might be interested in um, and how you see yourselves as science communicators. Um, a little bit of background on myself. Um, I have been in, in informal education and science education for um, about almost nine years now. And I also have a background as a historian, an art historian, ironically. Um, but I fell in love with science communication working at the National Air and Space Museum. Um, and there I create public programs um, and both hands-on interactive on-site and virtual programs now um, for every single age group from little littles um, to old, old, um, and everybody in between. Um, and Carly has helped me with a lot of those. It's been a lot of fun. I train educators um, and other communicators and facilitators. I do outreach across the local DMV area and now virtually across the country. Um, and I help develop like, exhibitions. So I do a lot of different things. And hopefully by sharing that, you can get an idea of all the different kinds of things you can be involved in um, in the science education sphere. Um, so today, like I said, um, we'll actually do a little bit of a warm up activity because I'm an educator and I can't help it um, to get us in the mindset of science communication. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the background and theory for um, informal education and you'll use me, you'll hear me use the term informal education a lot and I'll explain why um, here in a slide or two. Um, I'll talk a little bit about examples and applications of informal education, both at the Smithsonian and beyond. Um, and then uh, some time at the end to talk a little bit about um, all of you and the way that you see yourselves as science communicators, um, because that's exactly why I'm here today. So I wanted to start off with an activity I love to do. Carly's done this with me at the museum. Carly has done this with literally thousands of participants at the museum. I, I didn't have a chance to pull numbers, but I'm pretty sure Carly has individually interacted with tens of thousands of people at this point in all her years at the Smithsonian, which has been awesome. And this is one of our favorite questions to ask. Visitors will come into our observatory, the Phoebe Waterman Haas Public Observatory, um, and they'll get to look through a telescope sometimes for the first time, which is really exciting. Um, and instead of launching into an, a long explanation or um, trying to describe everything all at once, we kind of take a step back and the first thing we always ask is, what do you notice? So I want to ask all of you here today, when you look at this image, what do you notice? You can answer out loud or in the chat. Carly, can I ask you to answer out loud? What do you notice? Um, I see some dark spots on a round yellowish ball. That's a great observation. I see some observations coming in in the chat, sunspots, dark spots, spots. I, I love all of the attention on the things that are the anomaly, right, on this, on, on this image, the thing that doesn't seem quite in place. That's excellent. And I also love that all of you use different ways to describe that, dark spots, some spots, sunspots, 
Um, and that tells me a lot about your different knowledge and backgrounds that you're coming to the table with. So this question, even though it seems super basic and on its surface, has now provided me with so much information. It tells me that the conversation we're going to um, go to now is about the spots. I'm not going to talk about the color yet. I'm not going to talk about the size. You all were really interested in spots. So we're going to go there. And it tells me that not everybody knows what the term might be. So we need to talk about terminology and all of those things. So I've just opened up a whole potentially 15 minutes worth of discussion, all just based on one question. So this is, like I said, one of my favorite questions to ask when starting any interaction, both on site and virtually um, in science education. Um, and I wanna keep that in the back of our minds as we go through the rest of the talk, because a lot of the things I will talk about today will come back to strategies like this. So I, I mentioned earlier about terminology. Um, you'll hear me saying different things and that's because there is so much terminology. And as scientists, you will understand that terminology does matter given your specific context, but sometimes when you're outside of your, the environment that you're in, uh, that the terminology is being used and it can be confusing to see what, what people actually need and what's going on. Is it education or is it learning? What about outreach? What's, is science communication part of that? What's science education and formal education? It's all interrelated in my opinion. Um, now, whenever we talk about education, the term, oftentimes that connotes for most people, classrooms. Um, so the idea that you're sitting in front of an instructor or be, you're in front of an instructor and you're in a formal learning environment. Um, so that can be through K through um, graduate school um, for classroom education. Um, oftentimes you'll hear learning used when we're talking about learning that can happen anywhere. And we'll talk about where those spaces are in a second. But I often will make the uh, distinction in my terminology. When I talk about education, I often mean more formal spaces, though not always. And learning often, for me, connotes that broader audience. Um, and same with outreach. Um, I, the way I think about outreach is it's one of the strategies for engaging in education or learning, that you're able to go out and engage with communities um, in these types of learning and education opportunities. But sometimes it's used synonymously for education or learning, and that's okay. I just wanted to kind of bring that terminology difference uh, to attention and know that it's okay to use all of those different terms um, interchangeably, um, though they, they do have meanings in different contexts. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about informal science education. I chose, I'm going to choose to talk about it as informal science education today. Um, and that's because we're here uh, talking about specifically science education. If I was at a museum conference, maybe I'd talk about it as museum learning. Um, again, different context, different terms. Um, but when I talk about informal science education, I love to bring up this statistic, which was in a report developed by uh, John Falk and Linda Durking, who are um, leaders in specifically informal science education and informal learning spaces, and have been doing just amazing work for the last few decades. Um, but they did a, a really great study about a decade ago that showed that about 95% of learning occurs outside of the classroom. And when I start to reflect on that myself, I'm like, oh yeah, I spend a lot of time reading books and watching movies and engaging with things that I'm interested in outside of formal learning environments. And even though I might not think about that as learning, it is, you're gaining information, you're drawing conclusions, you're making connections. And so seeing those places as opportunities is really important for me as an informal educator. Here, um, pardon me, is a list of uh, some potential informal education spaces. Museums, I think, being one of the most popular ones. And I, I'm biased because I work at a museum and I think that they're a lot of fun um, and engaging as informal education spaces. But libraries, community centers, outdoor spaces especially. Um, I love learning in parks, being able to go around with a guidebook um, and identify different plants. It's such a cool learning opportunity. Um, home and the internet, I think we are all deeply, deeply embedded if we were not already in what that means as a learning environment these days, uh, now that we've uh, uh, survived a and continue to survive a global pandemic. Um, also hobbies, I think that sometimes hobbies get a bad rap in the learning sphere, um, depending on what the hobby is, but they're also great opportunities for learning, even if the, the hobby itself doesn't seem like it's connected to something that can really help you, especially in formal learning spaces, it often can. 
I also definitely wanted to point out emergencies when I've given this talk in the past. It has not been in a global pandemic. Um, so I usually give uh, examples of like hurricanes and things like that. Like how do you communicate in response? I think a lot of us have been doing this kind of informal learning work <laughs> over the last year. So I think we're really well acquainted with the emergency um, informal education space and we'll continue uh, to grapple with that as we go forward. Um, some other examples that I like to include that aren't on this list that was in this um, report by Falk and Durking um, include places like bars. Astronomy on Tap um, is a, is if you have not attended um, before, there's chapters across the country and they're short science talks in a bar. And normally I would not think of a bar as a learning environment, but the fact that they, you can use a, any environment to engage in critical thinking and making connections, I think is really cool. So now uh, that we're thinking about these learning spaces, I wanna kind of go over strategies uh, that, you, that I often use in these learning spaces. And I'll be curious if any of you recognize any or any of you use them in your science communication practice of whatever practice that you have. Um, but the first thing I always think about when I'm thinking about informal learning spaces, informal education spaces, um, for anything else, is about accessibility and equity. Um, I could want to teach everybody about the sun all day long, but if I'm not creating an environment where people feel like they are welcome and people feel like I'm addressing their specific needs and interests, it doesn't matter what my goals are. <laughs> so uh, everything that we're doing um, in informal education at the Smithsonian is audience centered. Um, and that audience centering really at its core is about equity and accessibility. Um, so uh, examples of that is how we design our physical spaces. Um, we do a lot of inclusive designing of exhibits, for example, making sure there's opportunities for all different types of people um, and learners, especially people with disabilities. Um, making sure that things are affordable and accessible and are if in communities and actually not in our, con our considered learning spaces that are at the museum um, sometimes can make things more equitable and accessible. Um, and then I think at its core for all of those decisions is making sure that we are training our facilitators and creating content and creating environments that are welcoming to people of, of especially marginalized identities um, and making sure that that's the case across the board for all of all of what we do. So this is the tenant that I keep in mind for everything else that we're I'm going to discuss strategy wise. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the kind of high level strategies that we often discuss in our work at the National Air and Space Museum. Um, that is around learning styles and teaching styles. Um, so when we talk about our kind of learning styles, um, we're, we're talking about what the learner is engaging with when they come to the museum, the type of uh, techniques that we're hoping to foster through uh, their engagement with us. Um, and that's really based on these two ideas here that you see on the screen, constructivism and co-creation. And the, the kind of fundamentals of those two ideas is building knowledge together. Um, we do a lot of theory work. There's been a lot of pedagogy that's been um, developed over the, especially later half of the 20th century um, around informal science education or informal education in general, honestly, but especially uh, science education. And these basic theories by theorists like Piaget, Bruner, Vygotsky, uh, Paulo Freire, um, all of them are talking about how the learner themselves are the ones controlling the learning and the teacher is the facilitator. That's a really important distinction, especially for me as an informal educator, because I think I grew up with a teacher as controlling the learning and telling me what they needed to tell me and I just took it all in. We flipped that model. Um, and think of it more as a facilitation rather than a kind of knowledge dumping. Um, so we build knowledge together uh, through specific strategies with the learner through that learning style. So constructivism, building that knowledge together, co-creation, co-creating the experience together um, so that we can make sure that our intended audience uh, receives the highest, highest impact from the experience. You'll also, if you've engaged with Smithsonian uh, kind of science communication or informal education before, sometimes people have heard of the IPOP theory. Um, this is, an, again, something that was developed about a decade ago by some of our researchers, Andy Picaric, um, being the, the one of the leaders of this study. 
And this was a study done of people who were visiting Smithsonian museums around BC um, and what they were interested in engaging with when they visited. And so you'll see here the words ideas, people, objects, and physical. So through their research, they found that um, by having different elements of exhibits or interactions and experiences at the museum um, that engaged these specific things, you were able to reach more people um, because people have different interests and reasons why they're engaging with the museum environment. So the idea is, is a lot of some people like to learn facts or dig into some critical thinking when they're at a museum. Some people like to learn about other people and their stories. Some people like to handle physical, handle objects or look at objects. And some people like to touch and physically experience their environment. These aren't mutually exclusive. An individual can want all, all four of these things at the same time or want each of these things at different times. But it was a good way to frame how we can create environments for informal education that supports these different learning styles. There is so much research done on learning styles and so many different kinds that researchers come up with, right? These aren't the only ones that are out there. These are just ones that definitely come up often in our work. Um, and so you probably have engaged with other ones if you are engaging in learning styles and learning theories. And I, I think a lot of them have a lot of merit. So picking and choosing what's right for your work and your audience is also really important. So you've kind of thought about where you're going to cre uh, create an informal learning space. Um, you're making sure you're keeping equity and accessibility in mind. Um, you're thinking about the learning styles of your uh, participants um, and who you want to engage with. Um, and after that, it's really about what then you are going to do, your, um, what, I, what you can often hear as teaching style. Um, now, I, I tend to not use the word teaching style, again, just because often teaching connotes a classroom, um, and I have never taught in a classroom before, um, though I'm sure many of you here have, which is awesome. Um, I often frame it for me as facilitating. I'm a facilitator um, of that knowledge building with my participants. And in that facilitation, um, what we're doing is we're doing things that are people centered. We're building relationships, we're building confidence and they're building curiosity. Um, I know Carly probably remembers this um, and I often talk about it in our volunteer orientation. The one thing that we aren't doing in our program at the National Air and Space Museum is sharing facts that, or that's not all we're doing. We're not just sitting here saying, a fact about the sun here and a fact about uh, a nebula over here. The facts are really cool and we want to get to them. But I think our main intention is to build confidence and build the interest to explore those facts for visitors themselves. So we're building thinking skills, we're building that ability to think critically and look closely, think through the scientific process, be able to engage um, in those conversations. And so that when they encounter these kinds of this kind of content out in the world away from the museum, they have the same ability to engage with it as when they were able to do it at the museum, instead of just remembering how big Jupiter is, which we get to eventually, but we help them figure out how we know that uh, first and how we can figure that out. So this is my favorite part of the job, of course, is being able to facilitate that skill building um, with our visitors. So I want to dig into some strategies that we uh, share with our volunteer corps um, and other facilitators at the museum that are kind of like the basics of how we engage um, in different uh, programs and techniques. So these strategies are not exhaustive um, and there are only some examples. And if you think of other strategies that you don't see on here that you want to ask questions about or you've tried, I'd love to hear about them um, in the chat or out loud. Um, but all of these strategies that you'll see are inquiry-based and people-centered. So people-centered, I've talked about that a lot. It's all about the learner themselves and what their needs and wants are. Inquiry-based um, just means that we're all about asking questions and building on that curiosity um, instead of uh, uh, the other way around. So the first strategy, since I just talked about inquiry-based, is that idea of asking questions. Um, so we love starting with questions. We love continuing with questions. We love getting questions. Just fostering that curious, curious environment, I think is really important um, to helping people not just be inspired and be confident, but maybe see themselves in a, having a future in STEM at all. Being patient is the hardest thing, I think, out of STEM education, especially in informal learning spaces. 
in classrooms, you kind of have to be there, right? Um, not now that doesn't translate to actually everyone uh, engaging in the way that doesn't mean you don't have to be patient, of course. But in formal learning spaces, it means that I think a little bit more work needs to be put in to make sure that people feel comfortable and engaged and give them time to think. So patience is a key uh, part of this. I also see this a lot when engaging specifically in astronomy outreach around telescopes. Um, all of us that have engaged with telescopes before, um, it might feel comfortable now, but that learning curve is really significant when you're first engaging with this technology. So being patient about that process can be really important. Talking about it, um, one of the my favorite parts about working at specifically the Phoebe Waterman Haas Public Observatory at the National Air and Space Museum is all the conversations we get to have. Being able to have different conversations and kind of go with the flow of the conversation can lead to a lot of retention, knowledge retention, and a positive feeling in general about the experience. And that can have a lasting effect in their curiosity about the topics that we're discussing. Be a role model. Um, this is something that I really, I, I love talking about with every single person that is a facilitator especially if you don't see yourself as a role model. I think sometimes we relegate the term role model to people who have the highest degrees or the biggest awards or a Wikipedia page. Um, they must be somebody who uh, has, has achieved a certain level, which they are role models and it's really exciting. But every single one of us is a role model in our own way and that can be really inspiring to our participants. So being able to be conscious of that and act in that way in all the learning spaces that we're in, I think is a really important part of building those connections between participants and inspiring that confidence and curiosity. In that way, one of those techniques in being a role model is teaching by doing, modeling behaviors. A really great example of this is with telescopes and interacting with telescopes themselves in astronomy outreach. Um, what end do you look through? I've had so many kids come up to the telescope and be like looking around at the tripod, you know, looking down through the aperture. They have no clue because they're not, they've not interacted with this technology before. And so instead of saying, look there and pointing to it and kind of letting them figure it out, I just model it. Okay, we're going to look through the eyepiece and I lean down and I look through the eyepiece and I model not cranking down <laughs> um, on the eyepiece and I model how to rest my hand on a stool instead and modeling all of those behaviors for anybody of any age, it doesn't have to just be children, can be so impactful in building that confidence um, around it. And once you build that bottom layer of kind of base layer of confidence, then adding challenges to it can have more success. So starting with the biggest challenge and making people feel like ugh, really uncomfortable, it, it can often uh, lead to discouragement, but building that confidence in the beginning can lead to them engaging more and more. Make it personal. Um, this is the my one of the most fun parts, again, back to that conversational aspect of informal education. Find out what people are interested in. Uh, talk about what they want to talk about. Share personal anecdotes and um, things that are relevant to you, and they might connect with your um, your participants in whatever informal learning space you're working in. Um, I love having conversations with visitors who are interested in art, or they want to talk about their favorite TV show that had the sun explode in it, like that episode of Doctor Who. Um, being able to engage those interests again will increase memory retention, and build that curiosity because you're connecting with with what's relevant to them. Telling a story, storytelling is a fundamental human um, experience um, that's always been there for us, and that's because. Um, and, and it's so impactful um, for the learning experience. So instead of just sharing, well, we know the sun is hot, <laughs> tell a story around that. How did we figure that out? Um, how, how do we know what the temperature is like and how do we figure that out now? Um, so being able to weave a story um, and be a storyteller can have a significant impact in the learning experience. Be ready for hard questions. This is my favorite uh, and it's tied to the, my last point on the slide as well. Um, but there will always be questions that are just like, whoa, I was not expecting that. Or maybe it's difficult to answer because it makes us uncomfortable or it makes the visitor uncomfortable. Um, maybe it's something that is just outside of our realm of understanding that maybe they come to the museum and ask me, uh, do dolphins have baby teeth? I don't know the answer. 
answered that. Um, I don't work at the National Natural History Museum across the street, but I bet they can find it out there. Um, so again, tied to this last point, one of my favorite answers um, to any question is I don't know. And that is such a scary answer uh, to give in any learning situation, especially because in a learning environment, facilitators and teachers are seen as an authority and are trusted to know what's going on. Um, and that's been kind of ingrained in how we see learning environments. However, all of us know we don't know everything. <laughs> and that's kind of the point of science, right? We don't know everything, so we're going to be curious and try to learn more and engage the universe in that way. And so by modeling, by saying I don't know and modeling that it's okay to not know, but let's figure it out, um, is a great way to also show how science really works and how learning works in general, instead of that false, uh, false sense of you must know everything, um, because it's just not possible. <laughs> so these are the strategies, like I said, that are kind of the baseline. I hear somebody might have a question. I hear somebody's unmuted. Yeah, so uh, we actually got a couple of questions. You, you hit on one, um, definitely saying, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so uh let's see and also one of my favorite phrases to use is let's figure this out together so then it's like we're a team working towards getting this answer um but one of the main questions was uh our observatory tour guides give tours to pretty wide ranges of audiences from scout troops to college students in intro level astronomy classes and senior education one of the toughest things for new guides to learn is how to tailor their discussion and presentation to the different audiences how do you help students develop the skill such a great question. Um, I'm, I'm really glad that you asked this because this is what we grapple with at the museum all the time. We have visitors from, like I said, birth to death all over the world. Um, people from all walks of life, all experiences, which is really exciting, but really daunting. And I think one of the very first things that we talked about today is really crucial in that when you are engaging an audience that you've never engaged with before, especially if you weren't able to learn about them beforehand, which if you can, do it. Um, but it's not always the case. Um, asking questions can get you so much information. Um, so being able to ask, where are you visiting from? What do you think about this? Take a close look, tell me what you think is gonna give you a lot of information about what they're interested in, what they're engagement, engaging with, what their background knowledge is, and all of those things. So I try to start out every interaction with those questions because it just tells me so much. And then the other um, part of this is practice. I know that's a lame answer uh, or, or, or uh, not as cool of an answer, <laughs> um, but I think that putting yourself in situations where you don't know people and being able to engage with them and interact and um, respond to them is the best practice. And that doesn't have to happen in a tour guide environment, trying it out at journal clubs, um, being able to talk to friends and family in a way that you don't normally talk to them um, be it just kind of practicing, asking them questions, listen, actively listening to their responses, and then taking the conversation towards what they're interested in and what their knowledge is, um, I think is a really great practice uh, that can happen. And of course, if you want to volunteer at the National Air Space Museum, you can practice with me and Charlie all the time. Um, <laughs> but finding opportunities like that, I think, can really help. And they don't have to always be formal opportunities like being a tour guide or a volunteer somewhere. You, did you have another question, Carly? Um, the other one was just, um, how do you handle a question a guest asks um, that you don't know the answer to? Um, and I think you, you answered that just by saying like, hey, I don't know. Um, <laughs> and let's um, figure it out together. Exactly. Like, um, what are the steps? The second part to that was also, how do you handle nerves at uh, talking to a bunch of different people? And like you said, practicing. I know that's how I definitely got over that. <laughs> Yeah, the nerves, they never stop. I will say that. Um, I mean, I've been, I've probably at this point talked to 10, hundreds of thousands of people individually. Um, and I still get nervous a little bit um, when I go out there, little butterflies in the stomach. Um, but I think that practice definitely helps. 
um, and, and knowing that you have the skills um, as you're practicing, knowing that you know what you're doing, like having the confidence that as you're building that skill set, I think is important. Often we have imposter syndrome when we go out into spaces that are new, um, even though we know we have the skills, it can take over. Um, but, but all of us, if we're practicing these things all the time, we know what to do. So uh, I think having, making sure you uh, engage that confidence within yourself, it's not always the easiest thing. Uh, that's really important to me. Marley, yeah, if there's any other questions, please um, keep asking or put them in the chat or anywhere. Um, so now I wanted to share a little bit about the Smithsonian itself um, and how we uh, create these learning environments. I've talked about the strategies and everything, but I want to talk a little bit bigger picture and then come back to science communication and you. So uh, the Smithsonian um, is a uh, trust of the government. So we're not a federal agency, but we are a trust of the government that was established um, by an act of Congress in 1846 um, based on the funds and bequest of James Smithson. Um, and in his bequest, he um, asked that it was for the increase and diffusion of knowledge. So that's kind of our, our mission at the Smithsonian. I'm on the diffusion end most of the time. I do a little research, but I'm mostly on, on that side. Um, so we have researchers, um, we have uh, educators and everyone in between um, working at our 19 museums, one zoo, nine research centers, and a bunch of other larger umbrella um, organizations within the Smithsonian as well. It's a really large institution. Um, and I think that number of museums will be growing soon. We just got two new ones approved by Congress, um, the National Women's History Museum and the National Museum of the American Latino. So we're really excited um, about those two new museums that will be coming to the mall um, in a few years. So we do a lot of different types of programming um, that relate to all the strategies that I just talked about. So I just wanted to share briefly a few of those learning spaces at the Smithsonian. Um, we have, I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna start from left at the top and go uh, across uh, the different images. Um, if you were in Washington DC in 2019 and you were able to make it to the National Mall for our Apollo 50th celebration, um, that is one thing that we do in our informal science education is do some commemoration and celebration. Um, it's part of our mama motto at the Air and Space Museum, which is to commemorate, educate, and inspire. Um, and so we were able to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the moon landing with this amazing projection uh, on the Washington Monument. Um, it was spectacular. We also create a lot of digital resources, especially now more than ever, um, as we've been in the virtual environment. Um, Journey Through an Exploded Star was a uh, project that was developed through the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory team. Um, and it's a great 3D opportunity to engage with uh, specifically supernovae um, models uh, that were developed with the Chandra X-ray Observatory. We do hands-on teacher trainings. Um, here you can see them doing models of uh, the moon phases and how that can engage students. It might seem like a simple thing, but we always, uh, we love doing simple models to engage with tough concepts. Outreach at places like AwesomeCon. Um, and uh, I know Carly, I, I tried to find a picture with you in it, Carly. I, I couldn't find it uh, as quickly as I wanted to for today. Carly's been to a few of these with me. Um, but they're always a great time. We have a podcast. We do outreach sidewalk observatory, taking telescopes out into the local community. Um, I have a picture of our observatory as well on here because I miss it. Um, and it's, it's a, a great informal learning space. And then we also have um, programs to develop uh, uh, not just um, the workforce, but um, uh, to help young people engage in science education and professional development, like our explainers program, which is a paid staff opportunity for high school and college students uh, to work at the Smithsonian um, and learn science communication skills. That's actually how I started at the Smithsonian was as a part-time explainer. So how do you find a job? If you're interested in science communication and all of those kinds of programs, um, especially at the Smithsonian, but elsewhere are really interesting um, to you. And you're like, oh, maybe I want to pursue that. Or I know somebody who does. Um, I wanted to share some things to look for um, and places to look for them. Um, this is always the hardest part, right, um, is being able to find where people post things um, and what exactly they're looking for. 
if you're looking especially in the federal government and the Smithsonian finding things like museum program specialists or education specialists, they're the ones that are doing the outreach work that we talked about today. Um, curators and researchers also do public education and outreach, but they also get to do research. And so that's still a great opportunity to engage with the public, but also be able to do research as well as part of your mission. Um, digital content specialists, especially at the National Air and Space Museum, the Natural History Museum, and other science centers and museums, get to engage in science communication every single day as part of their job. Um, so those are all other uh, excellent avenues, marketing specialists, even though marketing doesn't sound like it's what you're going to engage in, science education and communication is at the core of what that job is, especially at a science institution. And of course, outreach coordinators. So I'd say you will see most of the other ones before you see outreach coordinator. Um, I see this term less and less in the museum field and the informal education field. I don't know why. I just have not seen it as much. <laughs> I have no reason <laughs> for that. The best places to look for jobs, we have a Smithsonian job board um, uh, on our uh, Smithsonian website, which posts all of our jobs. That doesn't include our contractor positions or part-time positions or fellowships. Um, but there's tons of places to look for those. LinkedIn is actually a great place to search for contracts because people will post those individually. Um, museums and science centers like the American Alliance of Museums, the Associations of Science and Technology Centers have great job boards. And there's some great collators out there. One of my favorites is Muse Weekly, a uh, um, Department of Museum Studies at the University of Delaware puts out one of the best job guides every other week that I've seen in informal education. And they have a science section in there. It's excellent. Um, Museum Hue is another great example of a collator. Um, so finding those spaces, you can find a lot of science education jobs, especially um, in informal spaces. I want to kind of bring it back uh, to all of you here today, um, because we all do science communication in our own way, right? Whether we're in a classroom, whether we're talking with our colleagues or friends or family, or whether we want to have a job in science communication or outreach. Um, or education, all of those are science communication. And I think the, the kind of last fundamental thing that's super important and um, I think also is a, a little bit relieving to me um, is that informal science education is personal. It's what you make of it. There's no right way to do this. There's no one way to do this. Um, I, we, I think, especially in the era of social media, see so many people engaging in science communication in so many ways. We see our colleagues and friends doing things that are successful, and it can feel like a lot to think, well, I don't know if I want to do that. I don't know if I want to send tweets all day. I don't know if that's the way I want to engage in science communication. And that's great. That's okay, because the world needs all methods of science education and communication. So you have to find what you're actually interested in doing. It could be Twitter, which I love Twitter, but not everybody does. Um, so that could be your avenue for engaging. It could be being a mentor or role model. Um, I have the um, if then ambassadorship through uh, here as an example. It could be with doing outreach, taking telescopes out in your neighborhood and just talking to people one on one. It could be developing science communication uh, research and resources. I really love um, Dr. Chanda Prescott Weinstein's Decolonizing Science reading list as a great example of that. You could be doing a podcast. All of these ways are valid, and there's so many other valid ways to do science communication and education. So figure out what you love to do personally. Do you love to talk? Do you love to write? Um, do you love to just listen and engage in conversation? Do you love to go outside? Do you love to stay in front of your computer? And once you figure that out, you'll find your niche um, in science communication and education. So with that, I, I want to kind of, like I said, throw it back to you. How will you share science with the public? This is just a question for you to continue to think about. You don't have to answer it um, now, but I hope that today uh, I shared some general ideas and techniques that were either familiar and, and help bolster the things you already do or were new um, and hopefully have inspired some curiosity as well. I'm happy to talk with any of you. You can see my information here. Please give me a call, shoot me an email, um, and I'd love to take any other questions now. All right, well, thank you, Becca. That was, oh, I think that was amazing. Um, also, I like the fact that you brought up all the different types of communication that there are because next week we're gonna have um, other speakers as well that do different types of communication that you mentioned. Um, so yeah, just a plug for that. Um, <laughs> I think Jenna, you had a question, right? 
Yes, this is kind of tangential, so you may not know, but I was really interested when you mentioned the two new Smithsonian's, and I was kind of wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what the process is and how everyone decides what the next Smithsonian is going to be. Oh my gosh. You know, that's such a great question. I don't know all the specifics, but I do have a few a few insights, um, and it's mostly based on other museums. Um, but most of the time, new museums have been in the works for a lot longer um, than when they were kind of enacted as part of whatever Congress has passed. Um, and these were actually, I think, enacted par as part of a larger spending package. Um, so it's usually not one act either. It's kind of tucked into something else that's happening as, as, it, ha as it normally happens. Um, but for example, I mean, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, the National Museum of the American Indian, all of those were in the works for decades before they were ever um, even enacted by Congress and built. Um, so I think this is the, both of these new museums, they've, they've been advocates within the Smithsonian and the larger community for a long time. And finally, the, it was brought to this next step. So the next steps then um, is finding the new directors for the museums and putting together staff for the museums to then develop the museums themselves, both the physical structures and their collections and exhibits. And that'll take years. Um, it took took a long time for, for the National Museum for African American History and Culture um, and things like that. And actually, in um, our secretary, Lonnie Bunch, he was the founding director of that museum. In his book, um, he describes that process. I definitely recommend his book. Um, it's a great, it's great insight um, into, and, and he's a great writer. So interesting insight um, into how that process works. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right, and then I've got a few more. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's see, uh, how can I get involved working at the Air and Space Museum or begin to have possibilities to participate in an internship? Uh, how many different fields are there to get into there? How many? Um, such a great question. Um, and there's so many ways. Um, so I'll start kind of from uh, least amount of involvement to most amount of involvement. Um, we have our uh, volunteer course um, and our part-time staff, which are, is our explainer staff. Um, explainer staff are paid. Um, those are two great ways to engage um, at a kind of lower engagement level. So it's not um, everyday full-time, things like that. Um, our internships, uh, we have a summer internship program, which is a large program. And then we have our academic year internships. And I think the way they are, you have to be a few years out of school um, grad school counts as that um, as well, um, but within a few years of graduating um, and within kind of undergrad to graduate school, um, those will be posted always on our uh, Smithsonian internships page, um, which I can find and put in the chat here in a, a second, um, but that page not just has the National Air and Space Museum internships, here we go, um, but internships for every and fellowships for every single other um, other unit at the Smithsonian, which is what we call our different museums and centers. I just put it in the chat, Smithsonian OFI. Um, so our Office of Internships and Fellowships, and you'll see fellowship opportunities there as well um, in research departments, um, education, etc. cetera. Um, so after that is full-time employment. Um, that includes contract work. Um, contracts, uh, contract work is a really popular way of uh, having jobs at the Smithsonian, especially, but at other museums as well. Um, and I've seen it grow in popularity, especially over the last decade. Um, and so finding those contracts can sometimes be difficult, but being able to uh, check different specific museums' websites um, and engage with uh, people who work there. So I see contracts that come up for Air and Space. Now you have my email, send me an email. Let me know that you're looking and I'll make sure to forward things to you. I have a list of people I forward things to. Things like that can help. And then we have our full-time jobs, which often either get posted on the museum website under career opportunities themselves or on that larger OHR page, um, Office of Human Resources page, um, and on USA Jobs too. Um, those are the federal, the, the, the federal positions. Not every position is federal money, um, so it'll sometimes be posted directly on the museum's website. So tons of different ways um, to engage. Um, and I'm happy to uh, help find any of those opportunities. Um, all right, and I guess you would also, uh, you kind of also touched on this, but um, what should I prepare for before working at the Air and Space Museum? And what is a day like working there? Oh my gosh. So I'd say in terms of preparation, and I, I forgot to answer this part of the last question, so I'll bridge the two. There's so many different roles. 
um, to to do in a museum. I mean, we're as a museum, we're an, an organization that spans all different things. We have our business operations folks who are working in finance and accounting and procurement and contracting, and they make the museum function. And without them, none of us would be able to do what we do. Um, we have our entire exhibit development department and fabrication departments um, who are designing exhibits, putting physical exhibits together um, and engaging in that way. We have our collections departments, which develop, uh, which conserve and preserve our collections um, and move artifacts around and things like that. Um, again, critical work uh, because we have so many great um, objects at the Smithsonian. We have the education department and our, our education and visitor services um, teams who work with the public uh, directly and then also work across the museum with our communications and marketing department um, to engage the public kind of beyond the museum. And so in preparing for that, <laughs> there's so much opportunity, right? So I figure out um, not specifically what job you want, but what skills that you really want to develop and what you're really um, drawn to. Do you really love talking to people? Then um, uh, maybe a, a job in education or visitor services is the right way. And um, maybe looking for experience in engaging with people, customer service, things like that. Do you really love writing? Marketing and communication would be a really great avenue. So finding opportunities to practice writing, to have pieces published, looking for blog opportunities that um, you know pay a little bit and get that opportunity to get a little bit of um, information out there. Um, trying that on social media, all of those things. So I would find the skills that you're really interested in cultivating, cultivate those because those will be directly applicable to the different jobs. Okay, and then um, let's see. Uh, what has been seen with the observatory in the DC location, considering light pollution is brutal there. Yeah. Carly, what is something, what is the coolest thing you've seen? Because you've now, you've visited lots of telescopes. You've seen cool stuff. What about at Phoebe? Okay, so Saturn is definitely one of my favorite planets to look at, um, specifically because of the rings. Um, yeah, we can see the planets, uh, I think. I think I've gone down almost all eight of them. I gotta double check my list. Um, Jupiter and its moons. I think I actually saw, um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like one of them, it was it was in view the first time I looked through the telescope. And then after that, it was behind Jupiter. So then I could only see three of them. Mm -hmm. yep. um, well, the I sun. was around. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, the sun, I know a lot of people don't necessarily talk about observing the sun. And that's actually what happens the most at the museum. Uh, the nighttime observing stuff happens kind of like once a month, maybe once every other month. Depending and depending on the, on the weather. weather. Um, but the sun, it shines through. Um, it does like, if there's few clouds, you know, we can still be out there. Um, so I think that was probably the coolest thing, just like, because, you know, we. I look up at the sun and I took it for granted and then I actually learn more about it and it's like oh there's a lot more going on up there. <laughs> Absolutely I'm so glad that you shared that Carly because most people don't realize how, what a cool target it is observation target. Um, of course we get it because we love science and we love exploring our solar system and our and our and our only star. Um, but when visitors come to the observatory we tell them they ask what are you looking at what planets like it's the sun they're like huh <laughs> it's it's such a cool uh, experience but we we prioritize um the bright and close um and not the faint fuzzy um that's another uh though great reason for all the partnerships that we have um in relationships that we have with amateur astronomy clubs we send people to gmu um so we try to say well here you can do this experience and there's all these other groups in your own communities who engage in other things. So we try not to do it all. That's, we can't. We're in the middle of downtown DC um, and light pollution's pretty bad. Um, but the things we can do can still build those skill sets, build that confidence and build that curiosity so that when they go back into their communities and engage with amateur astronomers or their local observatories, they can do more and, and engage more and feel confident in that. So yeah, I think we, we imaged the Ring Nebula. Um, and I was pretty proud of that because it looks nice. <laughs> um, and we have seen Neptune. Um, I don't think we've caught Uranus yet, um, to my knowledge. 
but I would be able to catch Neptune. And that's, that's about as faint and fuzzy as we've been able to get. Um, I know Neptune's not fuzzy, but faint. <laughs> um, and I, we've got another good question. Um, one that I think will help people in realizing like, hey, it's okay if you don't know what you want to do right away. Um, what made you decide to make the change from art history to the Air and Space Museum? How did you go about that, uh, about that, making that transition? I forgot that I mentioned that in the beginning. Sometimes I don't mention it, but I'm glad I did. I'm glad I did. Um, yeah, such a great question. I'm a firm believer that no one ever knows what they want to be when they grow up, even if they think they do. And that's okay. And it's just about figuring out how you want to be in the moment. Um, or in the next few years. Um, so with that said, um, I did think I was going to actually be an archeologist. Um, when I first started undergrad, they canceled my program. I transitioned into art history um, and fell in love with Renaissance um, Italy and specifically women artists um, and feminist uh, theory um, in Renaissance Italy. So I, I still love it to this day. Um, but I think why I transitioned to science education and why I always encourage people to try things that are different than what they already do um, is because not, we often think or have been conditioned to think that we are not good at certain things. Um, and that's why we often fall in the boxes that we're in. I was conditioned from a really early age to think I wasn't good at science. Um, and that I, I, it didn't matter, just forget about it, stick to history, keep reading those books. Um, but I started working at the Air and Space Museum. It was a part-time job, I needed to pay rent. I was so excited to work at the Smithsonian um, and get this job, but I didn't know a thing about science education when I started. Um, and I was really grateful that somebody took the leap um, in engaging with me um, and saw that my, I had an interest in education in general. Um, my, my former boss there, Tim Rue, who is now at Space Telescope Science Institute, um, is the one who took a chance. Um, but I fell in love with science education because I finally was in a space where I was allowed to learn science and be excited about it. And there was techniques other people were using around me where I actually got what was happening and could engage in conversations and go out and explore on my own. I was blown away. I had, I, I couldn't believe that I was allowed to learn science and that I was good at it. Um, and so I decided then that I wanted to make sure everybody felt that had a, had an opportunity to feel that same way in spaces that make them feel uncomfortable. So that's not just science education. I want, I, I, I also try to make spaces where people who aren't sure about engaging with history concepts or concepts that make them feel uncomfortable. I wanna make sure that they have space to explore those and build that confidence and curiosity. Um, and science education is just such a great place to do that because so many people often who aren't already within science, the sciences, can just feel really stressed about it. But if you're learning in a way that's really about how you learn, you can do anything. Growth mindset is kind of my bag. Uh, intelligence is a skill you build. Um, and so that's why I made that transition. And who knows, I love science education and who knows, I might take these skills and do something else or continue to grow and change. Um, like I said, I don't believe what we all know. I don't know what I'll be when I grow up, but right now I love science education and these skills are gonna be um, so useful no matter what I do. That's awesome. Um, so that's all the questions that I have on my question form. I don't know if anybody else has any that they wanna unmute or ask. It can be big, small, anything in between. I have a question actually. So you, you mentioned, and by the way, great talk. Thank you so much for coming and, and sharing your experiences with us. So you mentioned earlier about fostering uh, critical thinking at the museum. I was wondering, what are some of the ways you do that? Such a great question and really pertinent nowadays, right? Especially more than ever. Um, and I think a lot of people, when I say critical thinking, it means different things, um, but the fundamental uh, way I think about critical thinking is being able to do two things, ask questions and draw connections between uh, things that either you might already know or things that you're learning. Um, so I know it sounds like a simple solution, but asking questions is really key to that. Being able to have ask people questions, but realize that they can ask questions themselves about the world and how they're interacting with it so that they can go out instead of just taking things at face value, they can be like, oh, 
well, what do I think about that? And what parts are, what are the parts and purposes here? What are the complexities here? Um, and they can start to dig into that on their own. Um, I also, it, I try to build in kind of like opportunities for, in all of my interactions, for like building specific questions to ask. Um, a really uh, great group that works on kind of thinking routines that I use often in my work is uh, Project Zero, which is from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Um, these thinking routines are often used in classrooms, but um, they're meant to kind of build that critical thinking skill set. My favorite starts with the one we started with today. What do you see? And then what do you think about that? And then what do you wonder? So it's kind of scaffolding the experience from things that are right in front of you to what connections you're making in your brain. And you can do that at any point in your life with anything you're engaging with. And that can open up a lot of possibilities um, for thinking and engaging uh, with different content. Um, another thing that's very personal, a personal kind of goal for me is um, making sure people are engaging with the hard questions and are engaging with things that make them feel a little uncomfortable, but in a supported way. Um, so uh, an example of this is that we have the uh, um, one of the first launch vehicles um, and missiles, ballistic missiles, the V2, the Vengeance Weapon 2, that was built uh, by Nazi Germany as a weapon. Um, and it also was a catalyst for the entire space age and space technology. Um, and I think it's really important to highlight that dual nature, and so do our curators. Um, and so being able to create a space to look closely at it and think about it and wonder, a lot of wonderings are like, wow, this looks like a rocket because it is a very traditional rocket shape that you would draw like in grade school, right? With the fins and the, and the kind of cone top, but then kind of those wonderings, what was it used for? And then kind of thinking about, okay, not all rockets are used for cool stuff. Sometimes rockets and, and launch vehicles aren't used, are used for war. And how do you feel about that? What do you think the people who built this, what were they thinking and feeling? So again, using questioning a lot to kind of build that curiosity and exploration so that they can then go out into the world and ask those same questions. That was a really long-winded answer. I'm so sorry. I got really excited to talk about the V2. <laughs> Thank you for asking that. Thanks. All right. Well, it is one o'clock, so we reached the end of our time. Yeah, I know. Time flies when you're having fun. Um, but yeah, so I guess we can stop the recording now.